something was recorded, something was measured, and then locked away. No public images, no release data, no press conference, just silence. The James Webb Space Telescope aimed at it, captured it, studied it in infrared, and then sealed the results. When asked why, even he doesn't have access yet. It takes time for the data to come. It will take them probably a month or two to write a new paper about it. So we might, um, at the beginning of October, we, we might see the paper. Early October. That's the earliest we might learn what this object really is. But the object is already here. So we ask again, if there's nothing unusual, why are the data locked? And why does this keep happening? It's not the first time this has happened. James Webb has pointed at strange objects before, recorded them, and then vanished behind a wall of technicality. A silence that isn't just silence, it's structured, engineered, built into the system itself. Because despite what the public believes, the James Webb Space Telescope doesn't belong to NASA alone. It's operated by a private research consortium, the Space Telescope Science Institute. And the people who decide what gets seen aren't the ones you think. They're not elected. They're not transparent. They're scientists, but also gatekeepers. Here's how it works. Every year, a few lucky institutions are granted time with the telescope. They submit proposals, long, complex, coded in scientific language, and if approved, they're given exclusive access to the data. That's right, public telescope, private results, for months, sometimes up to a full year. Only the original team can view what James Webb observed. They can publish, they can hide, they can choose silence. And with 3i Atlas, that's exactly what they did. One team, led by Martin Cordner, submitted a proposal. It was approved. They scanned the object in infrared, captured a full spectral cube, over 40 gigabytes of raw data, and then they locked it. Three months of embargo. That's the minimum allowed for this kind of observation. And they took it. They could have waived it. With one click, they could have made it public. But they didn't. Why would a team of scientists staring at one of the only interstellar objects ever seen by humanity choose secrecy? They'll say, it's standard, that they need time to analyze, that they deserve first rights to publish. But this isn't a distant galaxy or a cold star. This is a visitor, now passing through our solar system. And when it leaves, it won't return. Is it really just about academic credit? Or is there something in the data they're not ready to explain? Because here's the part that doesn't make sense. Another proposal from a different team, led by Matthew Pelikow used director's time to observe the same object. And those data? Public. Instantly. Two observations. Same telescope. Same object. One locked. One released. Why the difference? What did the first team see that the second didn't? It's not just the data that's strange. It's the path. Most interstellar objects enter our system like cosmic tumbleweeds tossed into gravitational chaos, sweeping through at steep, unpredictable angles. They come fast, they leave faster, but 3i Atlas, it's different. Its orbit is retrograde, meaning it moves against the direction of our planets. Already rare. But then it gets weirder. It's almost aligned with the ecliptic, just five degrees off the plane where Earth, Mars, Jupiter, and all major planets orbit. That level of alignment is statistically uncommon. Most interstellar debris comes in hot, from above or below, random, untamed. But 3i Atlas enters like a probe, flat, stable, calculated. And then there's the route it takes. Mars, then Venus, then Jupiter. Three planetary encounters in that exact sequence. Like it's sampling the inner solar system, Mars, the Red Desert, Venus, the Hell World, Jupiter, the Gas Giant, a tour of extremes. Not only is the sequence rare, it's backwards from the natural flow of gravity, not falling inward, not being pulled in. It's as if 3i Atlas chose its route. Avi Loeb, Harvard astrophysicist and cosmic provocateur, didn't ignore this. He ran the numbers. He calculated the odds of this trajectory. 
this level of planetary proximity and timing, happening purely by chance, one in 20,000. The trajectory is very unusual. It's aligned with Earth's orbit. The timing brings it close to Mars, Venus, and Jupiter. The chance of that happening by coincidence? One in 20,000. And remember, this isn't some TikTok conspiracy. This is Harvard. Peer-reviewed. Published. Contested. Yes. But not ignored. Still, the mainstream scientific response? Silence. Shrugs. Dismissal. They say it's a coincidence. That objects like this follow natural dynamics. Not intention. But let's be honest. Three interstellar visitors in just eight years? After centuries of cosmic silence? Oumuamua. Borisov. Now Atlas. Each with anomalies. Each arriving quietly. Too fast to catch. Too late to question. What changed? Have these objects always passed by? unnoticed? Or are we just now entering a part of the galaxy where things drift closer? And if that's true, what else is out there? Because this isn't just about chance. It's about pattern. The same corridor, the same angle, the same choreography. A comet is random. Debris is chaotic. But 3i Atlas feels designed. A flight path, a probe, a scan. And if it's scanning, then someone, or something, might be listening. The object is here, now in motion, and soon it will be gone. 3i Atlas is moving at nearly 60 kilometers per second, fast enough to escape the sun's pull entirely. Its path is hyperbolic, its trajectory open, it will never return, and worse, we're about to lose sight of it. In late October, 3i Atlas will reach perihelion, its closest point to the sun. That's when it will be most active, most volatile, shedding dust, ice, gas, revealing its inner composition under intense solar heat. But we won't see it, because from Earth's perspective, it will be directly behind the sun, blinded, blocked, unobservable, a cosmic blackout, for ground-based telescopes, it's a complete dead zone. For Hubble, which orbits Earth, the glare will be blinding. Even Webb, sitting a million miles away at L2, has pointing restrictions to avoid frying its optics. The timing couldn't be worse. We wait years, decades, for interstellar visitors. And now, when one finally arrives with enough brightness, enough proximity, enough mystery, we lose it. At the very moment, it could tell us everything, but there's still a sliver of hope. Two spacecraft, already in flight, are drifting closer to 3i Atlas than anything else. NASA's Psyche mission, on its way to a metal-rich asteroid. Ize's Juice, heading to Jupiter's icy moons. Both will pass within 0.3 to 0.4 astronomical units of the object during its peak activity, close enough to see it maybe even study it. But here's the catch. Neither mission was designed for this. To observe Atlas, they'd have to divert, burn fuel, change course, risk mission failure. In deep space, every maneuver is a gamble. Every kilogram of propellant is survival. So will they take the shot? That decision rests with mission teams, engineers, administrators, People who might not believe this object is worth the risk. But what if it is? What if this is our only chance to see an interstellar visitor up close? To capture real-time footage? To analyze dust, light, structure? Not just from afar, but from within the object's own shadow. There's one more option. A radical one. Avi Loeb has proposed using Juno, currently orbiting Jupiter, to attempt a last-minute slingshot toward 3i Atlas. On paper, it's possible. With a perfectly timed boost, Juno could intercept the object in early 2026. It would be the first time we chase a visitor from another star. But in reality, Juno's main engine is damaged, its fuel is limited, and the mission is already stretched thin. Most call the idea fantasy. Too risky, too late. But if it could work just once, it would be historic 
Because once Atlas moves past Jupiter, that's it. It fades. Its coma shrinks. Its spectrum dissolves into the background noise of deep space. And then, it's just another dot. Just another ghost. Lost in the void. And we'll be left staring at our hard drives, wondering what we missed. Because there is no rewind in space. No second chances. Just motion. And silence. So here we are with the most advanced telescope humanity has ever built, aimed at a visitor from another star. And what do we get? Nothing. Not because it failed. Not because the data was corrupted. But because someone, somewhere, chose silence. They say it's standard protocol. They say it's about scientific priority, about giving researchers time to publish. But this isn't a distant quasar. This isn't a star being born 10 billion light years away. This is here, now, inside our system. And the clock is running out. The data exists. The spectra exist. The high resolution infrared maps, they're real and they're locked. Maybe they show nothing, just dust, ice, rock, but maybe they don't. Maybe what James Webb saw in that tight infrared signature, in that faint spectral spike, was something we weren't supposed to see or weren't ready to. Maybe it's not about hiding the data. Maybe it's about buying time to explain, to prepare, to rewrite the story before the public hears it raw. Because what if the truth isn't scientific? What if it's existential? What if something is out there, not just passing through, but watching? And what if it's been happening longer than we think? We used to believe the universe was quiet, empty, predictable, but that illusion is fading. And all we're left with is the unknown. So ask yourself, if this isn't a cover-up, then why does it feel like one? And if the sky really is silent, why are we constantly being told not to listen? If you're still listening, still watching, still questioning what's out there, subscribe to the cosmic unknown. Leave a trace, because the silence won't last forever, and the next visitor might not knock.